Uh, now, a writer who um, isn't that well known nowadays, uh, but used to be a really, really famous figure in this country, is Rudyard Kipling. Rudyard Kipling, he wrote The Jungle Book, he wrote a very famous novel called Kim, he wrote uh, a lot of stories about India, he was he was born and grew up in India, uh, partly in India, uh, called Tales from the Hills and Ta Tales of the Raj, etc. Um, he also wrote a lot of poetry, and one or two very famous poems uh, that people still remember today, things like If and other poems. Um, and he also wrote children's books, some very good children's books. Um, he He's a little bit... He's unfashionable nowadays because he was associated with the, the high point of British imperialism, and he was very much the poet of empire. He became extremely famous all over the British Empire, and he wrote a lot of stories about British soldiers, for example. He, I think it was he that invented the expression Tommy, you know, as a name for a, um, a soldier, Tommy Atkins. Um, uh, there's a famous poem about Tommy Atkins where the soldier says, you know, it's Tommy Atkins do this and Tommy Atkins, but it's Mr. So-and-so when they want you actually to fight and defend them. It's a sort of defence of the common soldier, or worse to that effect. I don't remember the poem exactly. Anyway, um, now, I um, I read a number of Roger Kipling's books when I was a kid, uh, I, or rather I had them read to me when I was a very small child, the Just So stories, which are wonderful stories, stories like how the cat got its tail, and how the elephant got its trunk, and I used to love those stories. Um, and then a bit later on, I read for myself one or two of his stories, um, and one I'm very fond of, and I've just rediscovered recently, I've just reread it, is... Um, uh, a book, a collection of stories called Puck of Pook's Hill um, and this is one of the books I've been able to find online, a free e-book uh, and it's great fun to read these books again and you know they really are very good um, there, there's Puck of Pook's Hill and then there's a sequel to it which is not quite so good but it's still quite good called Rewards and Fairies which I think is a quotation from from Shakespeare from A Midsummer Night's Dream and what they are is they're a collection of stories told to um, well, they're not exactly told to. They feature two children called Dan and Una, who live in the country, and they meet Puck. Remember Puck from Midsummer Night's Dream, who is, as he describes himself, he's one of the old people. And he's this ancient being, thousands of years old, a kind of fairy, I suppose. Um, and he arranges for the children to meet various characters out of uh, British history, going back to prehistoric times. And they tell their stories to the children. And um, what it what it is, it's like a kind of um, Kipling's kind of um, version of the history of the country, told in in interesting stories, things like the Norman Conquest and uh, fighting the Armada and so on. But through the actual voice of characters who were there at the time. There's one story that actually features as Queen Elizabeth the First, although it's never stated that it's her but it obviously is her um, and uh, they're ingenious and they're very well written and also interspersed between the stories are little poems on these various themes of history the history of Britain and Kipling thought it was very important for children to know the history of their own country um, and I'd agree and, and in fact there's a problem nowadays that a lot of children in this country are very ignorant of large chunks of their own history because the way history is taught nowadays is in little bite-sized chunks but they're not connected together and several people have written books recently um, called things like the story of England to try to redress this anyway so Pucker Poots Hill and um, I'm just going to read a bit from it I, I strongly recommend it it's a, a, a quite a magical book and it starts it's got a number of important poems in it. it starts with this wonderful poem called Puck's Song so I'll read that and then I'll just read a little bit of the first chapter which gives you a flavor of it one of the things I love about it is, is the chapters begin with descriptions of the children in various places in the country. Remember, this is uh, the Edwardian countryside, so there are no cars, not much machinery. It's quiet, very peaceful and very traditional, with country people um, you know, carrying on things the way they've done for centuries or even millennia. And his descriptions and evocation of the country... By the way, it's set, uh, the countryside is in Sussex. He, Kipling lived in Sussex for quite a lot of his life, and the descriptions of the countryside are of Sussex, and I know Sussex quite well, and they are very, very evocative of the magical quality of Sussex. So here we are, here's Puck's songs. Puck's song, I should say. See you the dimpled track that runs all hollow through the wheat. 
Oh, that was where they hauled the guns that smoked King Philip's fleet. See you our little mill that clacks so busy by the brook? She has ground her corn and paid her tax ever since Doomsday Book. See you our stilly woods of oak and the dread ditch beside? Oh, that was where the Saxons broke on the day that Harold died. See you the windy levels spread about the gates of Rye? Oh, that was where the Northmen fled when Alfred's ships came by. See you our pastures wide and lone where the red oxen browse? Oh, there was a city thronged and known ere London boasted a house. And see you, after rain, the trace of mound and ditch and wall? Oh, that was a legion's camping place when Caesar sailed from Gaul. And see you the marks that show and fade like shadows on the downs? Oh, they are the lines the flint men, flint men made to guard, guard their wondrous towns. Trackway and camp and city lost, salt marsh where now is corn, old wars, old peace, old arts that cease, and so was England born. She is not any common earth, water or wood or air, but Merlin's Isle of Grammarie, where you and I will fare. And the first, first story is called Wayland's Sword. The children were at the theatre, acting to three cows as much as they could remember of A Midsummer Night's Dream. Their father had made them a small play out of the big Shakespeare one, and they had rehearsed it with him and with their mother till they could say it by heart. They began when Nick Bottom the weaver comes out of the bushes with a donkey's head on his shoulders and finds Titania, Queen of the Fairies, asleep. Then they skipped to the part where Bottom asks three fairies to scratch his head and bring him honey, and they ended where he falls asleep in Titania's arms. Dan was Puck, and Nick Bottom, as well as all three fairies. He wore a pointy-eared cloth cup, cap for Puck and a paper donkey's head out of a Christmas cracker, but it tore if you were not careful for Bottom. Una was Titania with a wreath of columbines and a foxglove wand. The theatre lay in a meadow called the Long Slip, a little mill stream carrying water to a mill two or three fields away, bent round one corner, it, corner of it, and in the middle of the bend lay a large old fairy ring of darkened grass, which was the stage. The mill stream banks, overgrown with willow, hazel and gelder rose, made convenient places to wait in till your turn came. And a grown-up who had seen it said that Shakespeare himself could not have imagined a more suitable setting for his play. They were not, of course, allowed to act on Midsummer's Night itself, but they went down after tea on Midsummer Eve, when the shadows were growing, and they took their supper, hard-boiled eggs, bath oliver biscuits and salt in an envelope, with them. Three cows had been milked, and were grazing steadily with a tearing noise that one could hear all down the meadow, and the noise of the mill at work sounded like bare feet running on hard ground. A cuckoo sat on a gatepost, singing his broken June tune, Cuckoo, Cook, while a busy kingfisher crossed from the mill stream to the brook which ran on the other side of the meadow. Everything else was a sort of thick, sleepy stillness, smelling of meadow sweet and dry grass. Their play went beautifully. Dan remembered all his parts, Puck, Bottom and the Three Fairies, and Una never forgot a word of Titania, not even the difficult piece, where she tells the fairies how to feed Bottom with apricots, green figs and dewberries, and all the lines end in E's. They were both so pleased that they acted it three times over from beginning to end before they sat down in the unthistly centre of the ring to eat eggs and bath olivers. This was when they heard a whistle among the alders on the bank, and they jumped. The bushes parted. In the very spot where Dan had stood as Puck, they saw a small, brown, broad-shouldered, pointy-eared person with a snub nose, slanting blue eyes, and a grin that ran right across his freckled face. He shaded his forehead, as though he were watching Quint Snout Bottom and the others rehearsing Pyramus and Thisbe and in a voice as deep as three cows asking to be milked, he began, What hempen homespuns have we swaggering here, so near the cradle of our fairy queen? He stopped, hollowed one hand round his ear, and with a wicked twinkle in his eye went on, What, a play towards? 
I'll be auditor, an actor too, perhaps, if I see cause. The children looked and gasped. The small thing, he was no taller than Dan's shoulder, stepped quietly into the ring. I'm rather out of practice, said he, but that's the way my part ought to be played. Still the children stared at him, at his dark blue cap, like a big columbine flower to his bare, hairy feet. At last he laughed. Please don't look like that. It isn't my fault. What else could you expect? he said. We didn't expect anyone, Dan answered slowly. This is our field. Is it? said their visitor, sitting down. Then what on human earth made you act Midsummer Night's Dream three times over on Midsummer Eve in the middle of a ring and under, right under, one of my oldest hills in Old England? Pook's Hill, Puck's Hill, Puck's Hill, Pook's Hill. It's as plain as the nose on my face. He pointed to the bare, fern-covered slope of Pook's Hill that runs up from the far side of the mill stream to a dark wood. Beyond that wood, the ground rises for five hundred feet till at last you climb out on the bare top of Beacon Hill to look over the Pevensey Levels and the Channel and half the naked South Downs. By oak, ash and thorn, he cried, still laughing. If this had happened a few hundred years ago, you'd have had all the people of the hills out like bees in June. So that's the beginning of Rudyard Kipling's Park of Poots Hill. I do recommend it. And that is uh, number one of my favourite books on my book channel. Uh, if you've enjoyed that, if you're interested, do give me a thumbs up and please subscribe to my channel. And I would be very pleased to hear any comments or discussions that anybody would like to, to engage in or, or hear about other people's favourite books. It would be very nice as well. So thank you and goodbye.